Good morning, welcome to Join News Desk with me, Mamisi Nyamiche Thompson. In the headlines, IGP interdict COP Alex Mensa and two other officers being probed by the ad hoc committee in connection with the alleged plot to oust him from office. Also, DVLA to phase out all PVC driver's licenses as it edges government to, or the public to submit the old ones for replacement. But at, at why and at whose cost? We'll find out more from here. Healthcare providers gravely concerned about the lack of neonatal care unit in the OT region, which they say is contributing to increasing rate of deaths in the region. We have details of these stories plus business and more coming up shortly. The Ghana Police Service has interdicted three of its officers who have appeared before Parliament's ad hoc committee investigating the alleged plot to remove IGP George Ekufu Dampari. According to the police, this will pave way for internal disciplinary action into their conduct. Kweku Asante joins us with details of this story. Kweku, what does the details of the statement you have say uh, on this particular interdiction? Peko, if you can hear me, what, does, what are the details of the statement you have on this interdiction? Well... We'll be hearing from Kweku very soon on this, but the police service, as we know, has interdicted three of its officers, including COP, Alex Mensa, um, Eric, and then also that of Superintendent George Asari, who have already appeared before the committee to give accounts or witness about the alleged tape to oust the IGP out of office and we are yet to know what the committee is going to say about the accounts we are yet to even know the findings or the um, um the gatherings from the committee on this matter but as we're hearing currently the police service has already gone ahead to interdict three of these officers and um, we don't know as to why they have done that ahead of the committee but kweku asante joins me with details of the of the letter of interdiction. Kweku, what does the de- what does the letter say? So we are we are in, we are in receipt of two um, letters. The uh, first is a press release published by the Ghana Police Service, signed by the Director of Public Affairs, Madame Akrofi, talking about specifically that COP George Alex Mendes and the two police officers who are the center of this debate have all been interdicted by the Ghana Police Service to pay for disciplinary matters to, to proceed. We are also a ticket of other specific telegram message sent from the Ghana Police Service to P.J. Alexander, ask him to surrender all that belongs to the police in his possession, including his official security service. And so COP and his two cents of this tape controversy have all now been interdicted by the Ghana Police Service. We understand there was a meeting of the police management board, the police council, yesterday to firm up this decision. And so all these officials have all now been formally written to. They've been asked to surrender their weapons, other service, um, other service properties that are in their possession. And in particular, you cited that wireless message that was sent Right, Kweku, we're grateful for your time here on News Desk. Well, we have a lawyer, Kweku Wusu Ajiman, joining us on this particular issue. Mr. Ajiman, can you confirm 
that your client has been served with this interdiction letter. Do we have him on the line? Unfortunately, we've lost uh, Mr. Kweku Uswajiman, lawyer to COP Alex Mensah and us. And when we get him, we'll be delving deep into this issue. But let's move on to the DVLA, the Driver and Vehicle Licensing Authorities, facing out an old or old, old driver's license cards issued before September 2017 from the system. The DVLA says these old cards will be replaced with smart driver's license cards. This was contained in a statement issued by the DVLA on September 6, 2023. The exercise, according to the DVLA, takes effect from now till 31st March 2024, after which all old cards um, shall be rendered invalid by the authority. But let's stay with the story. We'll be right back with details of more coming up shortly. Welcome back to News Desk. Let's now go to our first story about the interdiction of the police officer, COP Alex Mensa, and two others who are currently before the um, probe committee in parliament at her committee. But we are joined on the line by lawyer to COP Alex Mensa, Mr. Kweku Owuswa Jeman. Mr. Jeman, thank you for joining us on News Desk. Can you confirm that the, your client has been served with the interdiction letter from the police service? Yes, good morning. Um, yes, you can confirm that he, he has been served with the interdiction letter. This was done um, yesterday. Right. What do you make of this development? Well, it comes as a surprise to us because, um, as you know, Parliament is investigating this matter to establish the facts. And um, some police officers have already appeared before Parliament. Others have also given indications of their willingness to give evidence. And before Parliament. So um, this is quite a surprise to us. Um, but as leaders, as we have received the letter, we are also working on it to see our next course of action. Great. So I'd like to know how is your client reacting or responding to this letter? Oh, he's, he's fine. We have had a conference with him early this morning, and um, we are in a few hours from now. I'm sure by close of view, you also know what you make of this letter by the actions you will take. But what does this mean for you or even your client, uh, seeing that the case is currently before a parliamentary committee delving into the alleged leak for which the police has interdicted your client? What does this mean? Well, um, we, just, we don't know what the processes by which the police came by this new development. But whatever it is, we, we hope they, they have complied with the law. Otherwise, um, you will have our, 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 our response to them. So, we, as for the police, they have made their decision to interdict our client. We will also look at the circumstances surrounding the interdiction, and then um, whatever our client's rights are, we will make sure they are held. Well, talking about rights here and then the letter in question, what are your options, legally speaking, for your clients? What are the options on the table? Well, that's what I've said. We have had conference uh, this morning, and we are still at it. By close of day, we should be able to uh, declare in our, in our will for it. So you will hear from us. But will this letter be presented to the committee looking into the matter, I mean, as maybe... Um, um, a, a new development into the issue uh, for them to take a decision on it? It's, it's one of the options we are looking at because what this is seeking to do is to gag other officers who have tried to come to the committee to give evidence and which we think is, a, is an unhealthy development. You know, when you appear before a committee of parliament, I mean, whatever answers you give to questions which are posed to you according to the constitution, 
cannot be used against you. It's only when you commit perjury. Uh -huh. So if this is the cause of action which the police now wants to take, it, it has a likelihood of making other people who want to come before the committee uh, more or less a big issue in doing so. So there are options on the table. You will, uh, to the full extent, if you are clients try to get protected, you will go to that extent. Well, before I let you off, I mean, this letter is an interdiction. Your client is on his way out of the service. Really, what harm does it do to him? Uh, it does a lot of harm to him if uh, indeed the, the charges are established. The fact that he is on leave to retirement is not uh, enough if in the course of your service. You have done something wrong. This is just to do to the matter before us now. I'm just giving you the legal position. If in the course of your service you have done something which the police think they should investigate, they can still investigate even when you are yet to go on the channel. So, I mean, that's the position of the law as far as that is concerned. But like I said, it does not, my opinion on this matter does not depict the issue which is not before us. It does not depict the issue, yeah. But do you think the IGP even has a right to take this decision at this point in time? Well, I'll, I'll reserve that for, for, for later. <laughs> I don't think that will argue um, the, the points of law in this regard on, on, on the media. Whatever we are yet to come out with, if this is a wrong move by the IDP, the media will get to know. Grateful for your time here, Mr. Kweku Shajiman, who is legal representative for COP Alex Mensa. Well, moving on, residents of Dome Pillar 2 in the Ga East Municipality of the Greater Accra Region are concerned about what they perceive as exorbitant bills delivered to them by the ECG's electronic billing system. They are thus urging the power company to address the challenges. Karen Obing has more on this report. Residents of Domi Pillar 2 in the Greater Accra Region are becoming increasingly alarmed by what they describe as the abnormally high electricity bills they are compelled to pay due to the implementation of electronic payment systems by the electricity company of Ghana. They have been on the ECG's electronic billing app since September 2022, but argue the app does not accurately depict their actual consumption, resulting in overbilling. It's been about 12 months since we received paper bills for postpaid meters at least because I know of other houses around here that have prepaid and they don't have this problem. So since September 2022, no paper bills here. We contacted ACG and we were told that we can just do estimates around what we've been paying in the past and then go ahead and pay until this is resolved. But we know that there have been tariff increases. So we are thinking to ourselves, what if you are underpaying? And revenue is still being collected. You are here, they come, and they want to collect money. If not, they are disconnecting you. So we are concerned about the fact that probably we are underpaying or something. We just need visibility into what we actually need to pay. Just give us our bills. But it never came. The residents say they are unable to view previous usage, therefore making it impossible to budget. If you are on, on a YAM phone, on a YAM phone, this is how you go about it. If you are on, on, on Android, this is how you go about it. If you want to see your charges, maybe this kind, whatever that is happening, people have to get access to it because it's not everyone who even have a phone. So this uh, app that is coming up for the changes about electricity, they have to educate people for them to understand, to get access. So, because someone who is at the village, maybe an old woman, you paying bill, no one is around. How is she going to do that? In 2020, the electricity company of Ghana launched a mobile application designed to make the purchase of electricity credit and the payment of bills convenient for customers. The Driver and Vehicle Licensing Authority is facing out all old driver's license cars issued before September 2017 from the system. The DVLA says these old cards will be replaced with smart driver's license cards. This was contained in a statement issued by the DVLA on September 6, 2023. The exercise, according to the DVLA, takes effect from now till 31st March 2024, after which all old cards will be faced or be rendered invalid by the authority. 
We've been joined on the phone by Director Tr Driving and Training, Testing and Licenses at the Authority, Mr. Kafui Semevo, for more on this. Mr. Semevo, we're grateful for your time here on News Desk, but why has this become so necessary to make the change? Good morning to you and good morning to your listeners. Uh, you will recall that in September 2017, the DDLA introduced new driver's license which is also a card, but a smart card. Mm -hmm. Prior to the introduction of that, we had a license that was a card, but not enhanced like a smart card. However, at the introduction stage, people who had the old card had licenses that were valid. So we allowed that they, the tool were uh, to be used alongside. Now, from the day the new one was uh, issued or introduced, the old one was not printed again. Now, from the 16th of this month, all the old ones would have expired. So the invitation is for those who have the old license to submit them for renewal and replacement so that they will also get the smart card license. Right. Is this not going to overburden drivers? I mean, why will you wait when the license of a driver expires before making this change? So, ordinarily, if we were using the same license across the country, in the sixth year, you still have submitted it for replacement. And those that were issued, they are in their sixth year. So they would have still submitted them for replacement. So it's not a bad it's a legal requirement. Okay. But there's an interesting requirement uh, as part of um, the requirements to, to do to get this license. You have to do an additional eye test, which I find very interesting because though you already these are people already in the system who have, have, must have gone through all the procedures to acquire the license. Why is this also necessary at this time? Okay, thank you. The eye test has always been part of the renewal process. Now, the replacement actually involves renewal and replacement. So, in the sixth year, your license is still expired. So, as part, as part of the renewal process, that is why you have to do the eye test. Every person who has a license and has to renew it is required to do the eye test. Mm. Well, does this process have the legal backing from Parliament? That's the replacement. Can you I hear me? I didn't get the last I'm question. asking if this has legislative backing, or has it even gone through Parliament? So, like I mentioned, it's a legal requirement. You can refer to LI twenty one eighty, and uh, if you look at the new regulation thirty three. It requires you to re renew your license every two years and replace it after the sixth year. So the licenses that are issued, every two years you go for validation. In the sixth year, it is replaced. So it's already a law passed by Parliament. So. For, let's go. Let, let me get more clarity on the eye testing. Um, who is bearing that cost, or is there a specific place that drivers will have to go to get that sorted out? Okay, if you recall, um, about three years ago, we accredited eye test centers across the country to carry out eye tests for the services that are provided by the DGLA. And we have published the list of this. Uh, facilities. We've also gone ahead to uh, give signages that identify them and also provide means of verifying those centers. So the eye test is done by the specialist in those centers and the results get to us electronically and we can continue to provide you the service you are requested for. Right. So grateful for your time here, Director Driving, Training and Testing and Licensing, Doc Mr. Kafui Semevo there. We're grateful.
The Ghana Highways Authority is conducting an assessment on the Tema toll booths for fixing. Joy News in the last couple of weeks has been reporting the poor state of the booths, which have become a major scene for accidents lately on the stretch. At least one person was killed, leaving several others, other passengers with severe injuries from crashes recorded at the abandoned booth. My colleague Carlos Caloni is currently stationed at the Tema end of the motorway with officials of the Highway Authority and joins us live with more. Carlos, what can you report from where you are? All right, Mamiesi, I can say that uh, we have officials of the Ghana Highways Authority currently uh, on the motorway, specifically at the Accra to both area. If you recall, they gave the assurance two days ago when they spoke to us that they would be coming to the site to carry out some uh, remedial works. And so we've been here since morning, and we can confirm that they are here. I have with me the uh, director in charge of uh, road safety and environment here uh, in the person of Joseph Amejake. He's going to be telling us uh, the specific reason why they are here this morning and then what motorists should look forward to. Uh, you are live on Joy News. So uh, we see you here this morning. Uh, two days ago, you gave us an assurance that you would be here. Yeah. Now you are here. What is the purpose? Yeah, please, we are here principally to uh, carry out a final assessment of the needed works to be done to address the safety problems at the two-booth section of the uh, motorway. And so, like uh, you will see, we recorded some accidents here. We resulted in a loss of lives. And as an authority, it behoves on us to take necessary measures to address those safety concerns. So we are here. We did some preliminary assessment of the works that are needed to address the problem. Today we are here to uh, carry out a final assessment to, for work to commence tomorrow. So principally, that's why we are here today. So uh, as you can see, uh, we want now to limit. We want now to limit traffic, vehicular traffic, to the original motorway section of the at the two booth section. So we are going to block. The extension that we have carried out, we're blocking it with uh, concrete uh, bar uh, barriers. And then all of the original motorway section, the concrete pavement, we are going to clear them off. So that when you are coming from the Accra end of the motorway, you don't need to uh, divert your course. You just come straight using the concrete pavement section, and then you can get uh, you can, can go straight to Tama. And we are also going to install solar powered street lights to enhance visibility at night at this session. So that at least uh, it will enhance safety here. And also make sure that we put in the needed, needed sign, uh, uh, traffic signs, to uh, inform and direct and warn uh, road users. So we think that uh, when these measures are carried out, we should be able to improve safety considerably at this session of the motorway. All right, so for the purposes of clarity uh, of what you're saying, now in your short, you can see that there are vehicles coming all the way from Accra. Uh, they are using uh, the extreme end of the uh, motorway, which uh, before you were using to collect toll. But you are saying that uh, now, with the work that you are going to carry out, you are going to block all those areas and make way on the motorway itself, which means that when you are coming from Accra, you don't need to detour to the other end. You just have to use the motorway all the way. So which of the, uh, the tow boat are you actually uh, going to, um, you know, clear? So we have identified three tow boats which are going to be demolished. So we are demolishing this one, this, this other one, and the other one. So three in all, which are in the way of the original motorway session. All of them are going to be cleared off. And then, thereafter, you can see that uh, the way will become clear for road users. So we are not going to take a diversion through the other sessions, but we just come straight on the concrete uh, pavement session. And by that, uh, we think that we can eliminate uh, as much as possible the safety hazards here. Okay, so tell us also uh, whether you're going to repeat the same thing at the Tama end of the motorway. We want to understand. So the identified ways to be carried out at the both ends of the motorway. At the tem uh, at Tema end and then Accra to both sessions. So all the two sessions will be tackled concurrently. All right, so beyond this work that you're doing, what other measures are you going to put in place to ensure that motorists are safe because lighting is bad, uh, no uh, road signs and speed uh, control systems here? We want to know beyond clearing of these tow boats, what specific uh, actions are you going to take to ensure that road users remain safe on the Accra Tema motorway? Thank you very much. Like we all know, Moti was built about 60 years ago.
in the short term, all these uh, bottles and cracks will be sealed. And there subsequently uh, measures will be taken to increase capacity. That means widening the, uh, the, the lanes, to increase the number of lanes from two, two lanes to a carriageway to three lanes to a carriageway with interchanges to enhance interconnectivity and mobility. So that's the plan of the government and therefore the ministry and the Ghana Highway Authority to ensure that we provide Ghanaians and road business with better quality of service on our roads. In the interim, we see a lot of potholes on the motorway. In fact, this morning, driving uh, from Tama to Accra, you could see uh, traffic build up, which span over one kilometer when you're getting to the uh, Abatua area. Uh, due to portal, heavy portal uh, on the motorway, what uh, remedial steps are you going to take immediately to ensure that you're able to uh, clear those uh, portals to ensure uh, safety on the road? Uh, as uh, as you, you really said, there are manifestations of portals. And then uh, these things have been identified. It's not that we have not identified them, but I know it goes through a process. I think by now Uh, during the night, uh, you are like driving uh, in a demented darkness. You can't see anything at all. What, what are you doing as a safety uh, uh, officer, director of safety, to ensure that at least we have some lighting on the motorway? All the lights on the motorway are not working. Thank you very much. But before I even came here, I spoke to the contractor, our uh, straight light contractor, and I asked him to, the, the focus, the primary focus now will be at the two booth session for us to install a solar-powered traffic light. Then subsequently, we tackle those along the uh, motorway session. So principally, now we'll be looking at the uh, tow booth session to enhance visibility there. And then the next stage will be to tackle other sessions of the motorway where we need to put in uh, uh, street lights to enhance visibility. So it will be taken care of. All right, we also see a lot of uh, people crossing the motorway, you turns on the motorway. These are safety issues, you know. And so what are you doing? Every now and then, and in a week or two, it's open up. How are we going to deal with that to permanently put a stop to, to that to uh, you know, protect lives and, uh, on our roads? In the short term, we'll continue to block all those accesses. Because now, as you can see, communities are springing out along the motorway. You've been listening to my colleague Carlos Caloni interacting with officials of the Ghana Highways Authority. They are on the motorway at the Accra end of the motorway where they are trying to demolish some sections of the toll boots on that stretch because it's been causing accidents and being uh, rendering some form of, um, you know, uh, posing as danger to motorists on that side of the, on the, on that, on the stretch. And so we are trying to get the measures that the highways authorities are taking to ensure that the safety of drivers are assured. And so we move on from there. We'll go there later and get more from the highways authority as and when we get them. Now, the private legal practitioner, Martin Pibu, says the Forestry Commission's destruction of mining equipment seized from illegal miners is unlawful and a complete mockery to the Commission's efforts. His comments comes on the back of a statement issued by the Commission in reaction to Joy News' latest hotline documentary, Forest Under Siege. The documentary highlights the devastation being caused by, at the Apampama Forest Reserve by legal miners in the face of various national and private initiatives to fight the canker. The Forestry Commission, in what it describes as a rejoinder to the documentary, said it had seized three and destroyed over 70 excavators and other mining equipment within various forest reserves. Speaking on the Super Morning Show on Joy FM, Mr. Pebu said the act by the Commission is against the country's laws. The 995 says that this disease, and when the person has been convicted, they, they would take the uh, equipment and give the district assemblies. So the, the letter itself is, is, is a mockery, especially if you put it in the context that last year, this, uh, the, the uh, chief executive of the Forestry Commission went ahead to give permit for mining when nobody had asked him for saying. You remember, last year we had a discussion. I remember I even came in the studio. Yes. There was a letter he yes. opted. He had simply been asked. 
if they had any objection to mining, I think it relates to the Akunta mining one. And he said, oh, they should go ahead and mine. So for me, a chief executive who even goes ahead is running ahead of himself, encouraging companies to mine when they've simply been asked, when he's simply been asked about uh, prospecting licenses, I cannot trust him. I can't. And uh, the documentary shows people mining. The documentary shows pictorial evidence, for lack of a better word. You see? So how can we trust such a chief executive? Hmm. How can we trust such, such a chief executive? No, he's, he's just lost our trust. He's lost our trust. Mr. Alote, if he's still the one at push, he's lost our trust. So could you to be very clear and to repeat, the law says don't burn. Take these, go to court, due process. If the person is uh, convicted, then you would, uh, the court confiscates the equipment. Then they give the district assembly, see all the unmotorable roads we have in Ghana. Many, many, many uncountable or more trouble roads. So why would we be burning excavators? Why? Hmm. Why? So it doesn't add up. It looks like it's a ruse. And could you, you see the Brigadier General? I don't know if I've uh, yes, left your question. Yes. No, no, go ahead. Yeah. You see them in the documentary. And we say we're taking people to Niger. Was the president serious at all? Why would you burn it? Even con- also responding to President Okufado's comment on the ban against illegal mining, contributing positively to climate change during the 2023 Africa Climate Summit in Nairobi, convener of the media, of, convener of the media coalition against illegal mining, Ken Ashibe, indicated that the statement is contrary to the happenings in the country. He also spoke on the Super Morning Show. The ban of illegal mining and. Uh... I am not. I mean, I'm not. I'm not a uh, lawyer, but I'm wondering how we ban illegal mining. I know that uh, the mining that we were doing was banned in the colonial uh, days uh, when they declared uh, what we do as illegal. Uh, but you know, how do you ban an illegality? Uh, you know, because I think it's already illegal. I know we also banned. Uh, there was a moratorium placed on small-scale mining that was uh, lifted in 2019. You know, so that's when that happened. Uh, then in terms of uh, the 20,000 uh, Ghanaians planting 13 million trees, well, I'm pretty sure that would have happened. And the outcome is uh, 13 million trees planted. How many of those trees uh, are still in, you know, have, you know, we need to ask the Forestry Commission uh, to give us evidence of where those trees have been planted and how they're doing. But how many more trees? Have also very matured trees that are com- that are contributing to our carbon, uh, you know, uh, taking our carbon out of you know. Have we destroyed uh, out of uh, uh, the, you know this illegality that we're talking about, including uh, things that have been done by Akonta Mining going to the Tunnel Nimri Forest Reserve, including uh, Heritage Imperial being given prospecting license and going with eighteen also excavators into the forest and, you know, and cutting down trees. And a lot of that happening, you know. So I am not too sure. Um, and when we start talking about it again, so... Uh, the... You're watching News Desk here. We'll be right back with business. in the most challenging of times and the most unforgettable moments that kept us at the edge of our seat. Everything up till now was just the beginning. Legends go head to head as timelines have collapsed for the ultimate showdown. Welcome to Big Brother Niger All-Stars. Starts 23rd July. Headline sponsor, Money Point. Hello there. 
to provide timely information and to explain educational reforms and to discuss school models and interventions, the Ministry of Education, in partnership with the Teacher Education Journal, presents to you the first ever education TV talk show, The Edu Talk Show. The Edu Talk Show keeps you informed and updated on trends in the world of education. The Ghanaian teacher is so versatile. Provide him the opportunity, train him, and that teacher will perform wonders. Where are the women? They are doing very well academically, but they're not in the sciences and all of that. So technology is missing a lot more women that they could have had. You need to tell the parents, at the moment, what you are getting is, is covering only an aspect of your child's education. And therefore, it's very difficult for you to make any decision with the limited information you have. We still have more to do mm. when it comes to safe school. Mm. So join us as we speak to our guests on reforms taking place in Ghana's education sector. My name is Blessed Suga and I am your host. Welcome to Tema, the industrial gem of Ghana. Attention all dreamers, investors and home seekers. Mark your calendar for the next clinic of the Ecobank Joy News Habitat Fair. Imagine waking up to stunning waterfront views, basking in the warmth of sun and embracing the comfort of a home perfectly tailored to your needs. Discover a range of housing options that cater to every budget and lifestyle. From sleek contemporary designs to elegant traditional architecture, the Ecoban Joy News Habitat Fair has it all. But wait, there's more. This fair isn't just about buying a home. It's also about enhancing the spaces we live in. Get financial solutions to acquire furniture for that beautiful home, electronic devices, and more. Our dedicated team of real estate experts and banking partners are here to guide you every step of the way, making your journey to home ownership smooth and stress-free. Don't miss out on this incredible opportunity to make your dreams come true. Join us at the Tema edition of the Ecobank Joy News Habitat Fair, where possibilities are limitless. The Ecobank Joy News Habitat Fair 2023 is powered by the Plant City Extension Project from Cities and Habitats and sponsored by... Welcome to business. My name is Daryl Kwao. The International Finance Corporation has signed a 45 million euro loan to the Sundu Group, producers of home care and personal care products in Ghana. According to the regional director of West Africa at the corporation, Dalia Khalifa, the financing is geared towards expanding the manufacturing sector. She was speaking at the loan agreement signing in Accra. Loan to Sunda Group is meant to pave way for an expansion of home care and personal care products to meet demands in the market and boost exports. The IFC has been financing many economies on the continent, according to the regional director of West Africa at the corporation, Dalia Khalifa. The financing will also help create jobs. The kind of products that Sunda brings to the Ghanaian and neighboring country markets are critical for consumers. and uh, We believe that these kinds of uh, activities not only are important for the end product, but also they add critical jobs, they help in, in re-engaging the Ghanaian economy so that it can uh, recoup a, a little bit of what has happened over the, 
the past few years, but also expand into the future. And so we feel that uh, partners where IFC can provide financing, uh, such as Kusunda, is uh, really our mandate and, and what we aim to achieve. Managing Director of Sunda Ghana, Michael Ye, mentioned that the investment is timely and would aid them in increasing production and exports. So we realized uh, this African continent, it has a great potential. Actually, all of the consumption is upgrading and with the economy coming back I mean, to normal, we realize it's going to be the fastest moving uh, economy. So uh, with this investment given to us, we'll be able to expand more. Okay, we are going to invest this into our uh, production lines. We'll expand our product- production lines so to increase our annual productivity. And so we are able to export all of the uh, products manufactured here in, in Ghana and also in Africa to domestic markets and to the neighboring markets. The Sunda Group currently exports 50% of its products to neighboring countries on the continent. Now, Ghana is becoming the first African country and second in the world to issue the to begin the issuance of licenses for timber exports under the Forest Law Enforcement Governance and Trade Scheme. This is in spite of the country grappling with persistent concerns of forest degradation as a result of illegal logging and mining activities. But the Forestry Commission says it has instituted measures for strict compliance of tree harvesting regulations, including traceability in line with the EU's Voluntary Partnership Agreement and Emmanuel Baitkweku has more. So the Forestry Commission, taking a European Union delegation through tree marking and tariffing deep in the Bobri Forest Reserve in the Ashanti region. The activity is part of processes undertaken by the Commission to ensure timber traceability as the country readies itself to issue EU-approved licenses for the industry. The license is an implementing scheme of the Voluntary Partnership Agreement Action Plan signed between Ghana and the European Union in 2009. The Forest Law Enforcement, Government and Trade Scheme controls, verifies and licenses legal timber for both domestic and export markets of the European Union. John Alute is Chief Executive Officer of the Forestry Commission. Uh, we are here to practically see uh, the processes that the Forestry Commission and the uh, district go through, how we take the measurements, why we take what we take, and the processes in terms of the environmental governance here. Um, we'll be able to explain some of those things uh, to them. This forest also has um, two uh, contractors working here. Um, they, because they are working here, they also make sure that you know, they ward off any um, miscreants who would like to illegally harvest trees from here. Um, so the private sector people operating here, the Forestry Commission itself, and then the uh, local people, you know, together uh, we are able to maintain the, the sanity of the forest. It's when Global Watch revealed Ghana was the country with the fastest depleting forest cover globally due to legal logging and mining activities. The EU timber regulations aims in illegal by prohibiting EU operators from placing illegally harvested timber and derived timber products on the EU market. With the country grappling with forest degradation, EU ambassador to Ghana, Aishad Razali, reiterated commitments for forest conservation. I very solid of the tea, you know, on the identification of even individual trees identified in specific plots. And I have to say this is um, quite a solid system. We have a common interest with Ghana to work together to ensure a suitable and more sustainable exploitation of the forest. And I'm sure we will uh, reach uh, something which is agreeable to uh, everyone in order to preserve these uh, riches and to benefit for the entire population of the country. After the trees are harvested, they are transported to the mills to be cut into different shapes and forms for export. Managing Director of Logs and Lumber Limited, Avidas Jagalian, believes access to the license would expand their market exportations globally. Ghana, we have a good name because uh, Ghana is a country where, as I said, we have, I think, four companies in Ghana which are, which, whose products are certified. They come from legal sources. And today you cannot sell in Europe. 
or anywhere in the world, except maybe Middle East and China, but mostly in Europe, US, you know, they need certified, even Middle East, they need certified timber. The delegation also paid visits to the traditional council to address their concerns as part of the final phase for the action plan. For Joy News, my name is Emmanuel Batsquiku. And that's it for business. The news continues with Mamesi after this break. Hello there. To provide timely information and to explain educational reforms and to discuss school models and interventions, the Ministry of Education, in partnership with the Teacher Education Journal, presents to you the first ever education TV talk show, The Edu Talk Show. The Edu Talk Show keeps you informed and updated on trends in the world of education. The Ghanaian teacher is so versatile. Provide him the opportunity, train him, and that teacher will perform wonders. Where are the women? They are doing very well academically, but they're not in the sciences and all of that. So technology is missing a lot more women that they could have had. You need to tell the parents, at the moment, what you are getting is, is covering only an aspect of your child's education. And therefore, it's very difficult for you to make any decision with the limited information you have. We still have more to do mm. when it comes to safe school. Mm. So join us as we speak to our guests on reforms taking place in Ghana's education sector. My name is Blessed Sogan and I am your host. The absence of a functional neonatal intensive care unit is a cause for worry to quality health care delivery in the OT region. This is according to Dr. Osekofo Afre, the OT Regional Director for Health. As of half a year 2023, the neonatal mortality rate is 3.6 of every 1,000 live births. The situation is making health, focus, health service providers in the region believe that it's high. Peter Senu has more on the following report. Total mortality rates also increased from 1.2% in the half year of 2022 to 3.6% during the same period 2023. It means when our children are born, within the first 28 days, they die. It used to be the fight against maternal mortality, but now it is neonatal mortality. The current neonatal mortality rate of 3.6% of every 1,000 live births is attributed to the non-availability of functional neonatal intensive care units at the various health facilities across the region. Currently, the supposed regional hospital, Rara Government Hospital, has only one functioning incubator and a baby warmer to take care of newly born babies with health complications. Dr. Osei Kufafre is the Regional Director for Health. He has been speaking at the 2023 Half-Year Performance Review meeting. One of our challenging areas, as you are mentioning, is high neonatal deaths that we have seen uh, this year, which is very, very worrying, with many of the deaths occurring within the first five to seven days after the babies have been born. And our analysis have shown that uh, we don't have proper neonatal intensive care units, or what we call NICU. We don't even have incubators in the region to be able to incubate or help uh, babies who are premature uh, and they are born. He's appealing for support to remedy the situation. So we are planning that we need NICU. At least two or three or four of our hospitals should have a very functional NICU with all the equipment, the infant warmers, the incubators, and a few other gadgets that will really help. But the region needs an ultra-modern neonatal intensive care unit to help manage the units. Also affecting quality health service delivery in the region is the non-availability of regional medical store. The T region continues to depend on the Volta region for its critical medical supplies. But how is this affecting quality health delivery in the region? 
Dr. Afra explains. Unfortunately for us, we don't have a medical stores and we are still relying on the Volta Regional Medical Stores. And you all know the distance from Oti to the Volta. Imagine somebody crossing the Oti River with a pontoon all the way from Ketekrachi, going all the way to Volta Region to get medicines. We have a system we call the last mile distribution, but unfortunately, uh, even though it's working, we are not able to get all the medicines that we need. So the availability of medicines to uh, manage all our health conditions is becoming a challenge. So Mrs. Eva Mensa is the director, nursing and midwifery for Ghana Health Service and a parent to the OT region. She says the departure by health workers for greener pastures is worrying and affecting health delivery, although figures are yet to be collated on the numbers that have left so far. We are losing nurses for greener pastures and currently midwives have also joined uh, to the diaspora for, for better conditions of service, I would say. International markets is looking for experienced nurses. They are looking for nurses who have specialties. So those who are going mainly are experienced, they have specialties. Some of them are as high as principal uh, nursing officers. Some of them are even deputy directors and they are leaving for greener pastures. So it's, it is worrying. Uh, I wouldn't say we have data on its effect now. What I can say is that uh, it's really affecting health service delivery. Also affecting quality health delivery in the region is the continuous absence of a secondary referral facility in the region. The time and resources to go to the farm site to monitor the conditions of it and to manually irrigate it may deter many from partaking in the venture. Fortunately, a mechanical engineering student of the Sunyani Technical University has developed a smart farming system to curtail these problems. Lava Femme's Chrissy Debra speaks with developer Esther Bani for Tech Thursday. Um, this smart green, that's our innovate project. We have it embedded in an app. We have created an app for it. And with the app, we have the farm. And when you go to the farm like this, it tells you the temperature, the humidity, and the moisture content. But right now, I have not kept the sensor inside the soil, so it will be zero. But when I put the sensor inside the soil, it will begin to read um, the moisture content in the soil. So let's give it some time. So as I'm doing, I'll be talking. So it tells us the moisture content in the soil. So let's take lettuce, for instance. If we are um, planting lettuce, Lettuce um, needs more water and can be watered twice a week. And then, it, you know, we know lettuce is shallow. It has shallow roots. So this is the moisture content right now. So the moisture content is 14%. The humidity is 78. And the temperature is 27.1. That's for the surrounding of this right now. And so there are other things that we have in the app. We have visual uh, assist, which you can click on it and then ask, oh, how do I plant lettuce? How do I plant tomatoes? It will assist you. And then we have the learning aspect of it. You can also click on it. It will tell you how to plant some things and then what are the things you can do with it. We have the visual farm and then we have the plant diagnose. So with the plant diagnose, you just take a picture of the plant and then you upload it on Google. And it will tell you the disease that the plant is having right now. And then with the pump right now, we have it. And then if, let me say the moisture content is not up to what the plant needs. All you need to do is just click on the pump and then the water will begin to come. Um, this is it. We have the pump on and then we have the other thing. So when we click here, click on the pump on, it will begin to um, sprinkle the water for you if you are using sprinklers. But if you are using a tube like this, it will, you can lay it somewhere that it will spread the water throughout the place. And then when it's enough for what you need, all you need to do is to long press on the pump and then it will do pump off. In the annals of history, the name Major General Constance Emefa Ajiani Afenu stands as a beacon of resilience, dedication, and the unwavering pursuit of equality. As the first female general in the Ghana Armed Forces, her journey was marked by both remarkable achievements and trials. Speaking at the launch of her book, The Lady in Boots, Ghana's ambassador to Egypt, Lieutenant General Obed Boama said, was a trailblazer for women in the service. This morning's report. Transcends the battlefield, leaving an indelible mark on the very essence of service. Major General Constance Emefa Ajini Afenu, her book Lady in Boot, stands as a testament to her indomitable spirit. 
At the launch, Ghana's ambassador to Egypt, Lieutenant General Obed Boama, touched on her profound commitment to women's empowerment in the service. A trailblazer in the Ghana Armed Forces. She has chalked so many fits. First uh, commanding officer of a regiment, the Peace uh, Regiment, the first lady to have served as a deputy military advisor in New York at the United Nations, and most importantly, the first lady to be the deputy force commander in the UN mission in the Western Sahara. The book covers a lot of topics. If you want to know command and leadership style, especially for females. Concern is an example of determination and focus and staying professional and not dabbling in things that are not related you know, to the professional calling. For Brigadier General Anita Asma, the content of the Lady in Boots exhibits the late Major General's passion for her career. She goes into details from her childhood right up to when she finished serving her last um, appointment. She carries you along in the reading of the book. It's very interesting to read. And she has advice for both children, women, young girls, and even the Ghana Armed Forces. Whatever she saw as wrong, she was very plain spoken in the book. She addressed issues as they were. And she stressed on those that needed to be stressed. The legacy of the late Major General, according to her sister, Akofa Ejiani, will be preserved through the book to impact the younger generation. Definitely, I believe so, that her legacy will be preserved. You know, because generations unborn will come and still read this book. Uh, one of the things we want to do is to send copies of the book to secondary schools uh, across Ghana so that they can have it in their libraries. So generations unborn will definitely read about her and know that there's no challenge one cannot surmount if you put your mind to it. The lady in boots, Major General Constance MFA Acheni Afenu, has exited the land of the living. But her legacy lives on. For Joy News, Jacqueline Ansuma Yaboa. And that's all we have here on News Desk. We'll be back at midday with more. There's more news on myjoyonline.com. I am Anissi Yamachet Thompson. Thank <laughs> you.